The state of Connecticut's done an excellent job on putting forth training money. And, you know, by getting together with other people and talking to them just like, what are you doing? How are you doing it? You learn about something really specific that's really tangible that you can apply to your business. So I definitely, uh, it's always fruitful to talk to others about what they're doing, other business owners, even if they're not in the same industry. It's great to just, you know, what's best practices? What are you doing? What are you thinking about? Just a quick reminder for you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari. Welcome to another episode of the Made in America podcast. Today, I'm with David Kremen, president of Stratton Industries. David, thank you so much for coming on today. It's great to be here, Ari. It's a pleasure to have you. It's the Made in America podcast, David. So we start off with the same two questions. What do you make and why do you make it? Well, we make really cool custom machine components. They go all over the world and even outside of the world. And why do we make it? Well, it's, uh, it's really rewarding at the end of the day to make something that you can hold in your hand. And uh, if we don't do it, who will? <laughs> there you go. And I think it's really interesting. I mean, from, you know, uh, humble beginnings 61 years ago to putting equipment uh, on another planet. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, journey and I'm looking forward to talking all about it. Um, but before we get into sort of the details of what you make and, and, and why in all those details, why do you do it, David? How did you get into the business? Kind of give us that background. Well, I sort of grew up in this environment. I was kind of a shop kid. My dad had started the company in 1961. That was a few years before I was even born. So I sort of came to it naturally, and I would say to my dad, hey, I want a new bike. And he'd say, I'd say, you know, how can I get a new bicycle? And he'd say, well, work hard and persevere. Yeah. And I said, well, where do I work, dad? Well, you can come down to the shop and sweep up. So I started out, you know, I came down and I just cleaned up with a broom and that sort of thing. Now, this is the early 1970s when I'm doing this. So this is not like today's environment of manufacturing. This is a place that didn't have air conditioning. You know, there were chips all over the floor, that kind of thing. That was, that was my introduction into this. But, uh, you know, that's how I was able to do things like buy a bicycle. It was just, you know, by indoctrination through just, you know, doing that kind of thing. So it was early exposure for me, really. But I didn't really get the bug to do this until much later. I thought that, uh, you know, this was not really going to be my calling to be in a, at that time, you know, a pretty uh, smelly, messy machine shop. Mm -hmm. And I had an uncle who was a, uh, a pilot for American Airlines. And I thought, well, that's what I'll do. And, um, and so I enrolled in Embry-Riddle University down in Daytona Beach, Florida, and had a great freshman year. I soloed. It was fantastic. But while I was there, I took an accounting course. And not that I became, uh, you know, I didn't have the accounting bug, but I did get the fever for, like, you know, um, entrepreneurship. And, you know, I thought of the business, and I, you know, I came back up and got into it and um, enrolled in the University of Bridgeport. And, you know, I enrolled in the uh, tool and die apprenticeship program at the same time. So uh, well, I was so a busy really, guy. Yeah, yeah, you were a busy guy. I was a guy. busy guy. So did you finish? So you went down to Daytona Beach. There was like an airplane school. Is that what it was? Yeah, it's right at Daytona International Airport. And it is really the, you know, the, uh, the school to go to if you want to be a pilot outside of just going right into the military. And so did you finish that coursework or you just... I did. I soloed at the end of the uh, first year and I was really psyched, but uh, I knew that that really wasn't going to be my calling. It's pretty, you know, as you can imagine, being in a cockpit is a pretty rigid environment as it should Ooh, be. It's got to be, as right? Everything be. everything runs a checklist. Right. You got to make, can't That's miss right. anything. Right. Um, and so accounting sort of led you back home. You did University of Bridgeport, both the uh, educational side. Right. And it sounds like you also enrolled in some manufacturing background right. it's as really, well. They're both four-year degrees, so to speak. One is, you know, you're a tool and die maker. It's going to take you four years. And the other one is, you know, undergraduate. So it's, that's the other four years. And the whole time thinking, I'm going to go work at uh, work and maybe hopefully eventually take over dad's shop. Yeah, that was really my intention. And uh, we were at the right age spacing. We we're about, you know, my dad was about 31 years older than me. So it was a really good spacing between the two of us. And uh, he clearly wanted to retire. I could see that. You know, he was like, you know, I've had enough of this. And so uh, we were shifting gears well together. So there's something that you brought up before, which we talk about a lot, but I'd like to dig into it. And really, maybe you started to bring some visualization to it, which is I often am 
heard talking about the manufacturing in the 21st century isn't the dark, dirt, dirty, dingy days of no. yesteryear, but it's the lean, green, clean manufacturing of the future. I say that all the time. Maybe you could paint a picture for folks out there who don't really remember what manufacturing was like, weren't born uh, anywhere near the 1970s. What, what was it like then? Like what, what was so different then? Entirely different, <laughs> entirely different. Uh, you would be in a building that wouldn't be air conditioned to start with. So you'd have these big kind of iron windows that would open out, <laughs> they'd kind of hinge out. Uh, the smell was really different, it was pungent. It was just this really acrid kind of smell from cutting oil. Okay. Um, it wasn't like really sophisticated coolants that were synthetic. This was really like, I don't know where it came out of. It was just pumped out of the ground, I guess. Did, didn't feel healthy breathing? Yeah, it didn't, didn't feel um, Chips everywhere. I mean, they used to just take the chips and just push them against the wall. So it was like a sloping, cascading uh, <laughs> pile. It was, and I was, sh I was shorter, of course. So th they would be above my eye line. You know? <laughs> so um, maintenance was non-existent. It was just, you know, use it till it breaks. Is that what, so, no preventative maintenance? Very little, very little. It was just, just keep using it. Uh, it was just a really, really different. And my dad probably ran one of the better companies too. <laughs> <laughs> that was, the, that was the high end of, uh, of manufacturing yeah. in the, in the 1970s. And I just, I wanted to, you brought a really cool picture. So I, I know, uh, I don't always, I, I rarely watch. I like to see myself. I listen. So for those that are listening, it's a really nice gold frame picture. Uh, it says Stratton Industries established 1961. And there was a small picture. Maybe you want to talk us through it, David, because I, I couldn't guess what this, well, clearly it was the Stratton Industries and 1961. But looking at the building itself, it was clear it wasn't initially built for that purpose. So No, my dad had explained this to me because, of course, this was before my time. And this is where they, he and his partner, Vic Lasner, started in 1961. They didn't want to be in a basement. They really wanted to have their own building. They didn't have any money. They were in their 20s. Uh, so they found this old sort of abandoned gas station building. It was kind of like an attendance building from what I can see. It's so tiny. And um, that's what they, they were able to rent. What could they rented even it out. fit in there? Well, if you look through the window closely, there's a, like a drill press you can see on the left-hand window. Oh, yeah. So they probably could fit three or four machines. That's all they had. Uh, they were tool and die makers. And, you know, they, there was a lot of metal stamping in the Bridgeport area at that time. So they kept busy doing that. And, uh, but they outgrew it within just a few years. And then they, they moved to our current, one of our current locations over on Surf Avenue in Stratford. And um, they rented there as well. But this was, you know, I always found this picture to be a good reminder of humble beginnings. <laughs> <laughs> we're now, you know, we're up about 40,000 square feet. Within a year, we'll be at 50,000 square feet. So we've come a long way. Yeah, yeah, that, that's like 100 square feet. No, maybe not quite, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but not much more. Maybe I mean, you could small. fit a cot in there. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so talk about sort of the evolution of the business, because you guys are much more than tool and die makers today. Yeah, we haven't changed our name. Uh, it was Stratton Tool and Die, and again, in the Bridgeport area, it was there was quite a bit of work. And then as um, foreign competition came in, particularly Japan, it really started to have an impact on the area of you know the Northeast U.S. with um, metal stamping. Particularly, it got really really difficult to keep that business going. And Tool and Die really defined you very very you know focused. Mm -hmm. So we changed the name to Industries because we started to see that CNC machining, automated type machining, was coming on, and that was going to be really the future. And we wanted to have more of a broader base of understanding that we could go in and talk to different companies about what we're doing. So we really started to taper off on tool and die making, although it's a great art. It's a, it's a really demanding business. Um, but CNC machining was the, the wave of the future, and that's where we went. And so what does that mean from a customer standpoint? Like, what did you pivot to from different products and different customers? So we really pivoted more to aircraft, and we had Avco like homing at that time in our backyard. They were the Army engine plant that was still in Stratford. So that was a good place. It was a, a, a company with a lot of needs. And uh, so that was one area that we pivoted to that we could start to deploy just general machining towards. And so have you, has the company really been aerospace-focused since then? Yes, uh, aerospace focused. Uh, we're also in the semi semiconductor industry as well, um, but we've been in medical. I mean, historically, we've touched everything, everything from nuclear subs to space components and, and in between. 
Yeah, that's a pretty wide it's range. A wide range. So you brought you brought something to to share. So I you know I picked it up initially and mentioned that initially made me think of like a mini mag light flashlight. If anyone sort of seen one of those, but turns out it has nothing to do with a flashlighting. No, starting with the material, that's titanium. So we really start out with just a big chunk of titanium. We carve it down, we turn it down, and then mill it. And you see all these facets on it. And uh, the end use of that is that there's duplicate parts of that that are currently on Mars gathering soil. And uh, they will be dropped on the surface of Mars to be picked up later and then returned to Earth. It'll be the first object to come back from another planet, a man-made object. Is that wait? So let's say that again. So this is going to Mars. This has gone to Mars. It's it's, already. it's, yeah. it's gone to Mars. It's, it? it's duplicate parts. Right, right. Yes. Not this particular right. piece. So it's there now, or we're on some way. Yeah, back? they're loaded up on Perseverance. They're gathering soil samples into that tube, and it's kind of a cartridge system. So it's only part of it. It will then be dropped on the surface of Mars, and then later a fetcher uh, craft will go up and pick it up and come back. So perseverance stays, but the perseverance thing gets stays, left but behind. the tubes, the tubes the come tube back. The tube gets picked up. Right. That's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. It was a, it was a real challenge to make that. There's very exacting tolerances on that, uh, as there are no service calls going to Mars. No, so it's really say. hard to send the service guys up there. <laughs> yeah. So everything's really exacting, very very particular. I mean, it's it's really it's going to be impossible to really see, uh, you know, even on on the sort of the video of this. But I mean, the it's amazing the amount of intricate sort of like tool of uh, intricate work that goes into creating this thing. I mean, oh, yeah. inside the outside, it's really, yeah. it's really exacting. Yeah. We have a pile of scrap ones that didn't make it because <laughs> that's how, that's how tough it is to get one right. So is, so you've gotten, you've, we've gone from, from tools to stamping to uh, things for outer space. Does that look like a lot of more of the future for you? Oh uh, yeah. Space? I think space is really exciting. There's so many things. There's so many groups doing so many things and they're not all giant companies too. There's some really small startups that are doing interesting work. Uh, so I think the, uh, the future of someone's minded that they would like to do that kind of work, it's, it's going to be vast and it's, it's, you know, it's very demanding, but uh, there's a great future. I think it's really exciting. Everything from the commercial side to the military side is going to be uh, very robust from what I can see. Maybe kind of peel out the back a little bit because it sort of feels like a really small niche part of aerospace, right? The, the space part. You see some real growth there? I do. I think particularly with the reusables that we see with SpaceX, um, that changed the game. You know, the cost per, per launch is now substantially lower. Uh, so I see uh, it's, it's really changed. Is there enough work to what, I mean, what are we doing with this stuff? We're just like launching satellites. Isn't there sort of a limit to how much stuff we're going to launch? Well, I don't know. If you talk to Elon, he wants to be up there. He wants to actually be walking around on Mars. So <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, I don't know that there's going to be a limit for a while, but certainly, you know, communications is a big one right now mm -hmm. that we can see. Um, I, I think also we do have a defense related concern that uh, is going to also keep it growing. Do you envision any ability for there to be sort of, I mean, you know, there, I know there is some recreational space travel, which is very limited subscription because of what it costs. Do you see that sort of expanding and any opportunities in that area? I, I do. I think, uh, you know, someday I think my children will uh, get on a, an aircraft of some type. They'll say, hey, we're going to Tokyo for lunch. We'll be back for dinner. And I think that basically that's all in play. I think it's very feasible we're going to see that. In your, in, in your kid's lifetime? In my kid's lifetime. Maybe even in mine. And air taxis are another one that are really exciting. Someday you'll go to the airport, not by your car, and air taxi will come to a central location. You'll get in it. It may not even be manned, and it's going to be electric, you know, vertical takeoff, and it's going to drop you off at Bradley Airport in 40 minutes or whatever it may be. It'll be affordable. Really? Yeah. That's, that's basically here now. Are people working on that? There's a lot of people working on that. Is there and there's like economic viability to sort Seems of make so. that? Seems so. Yeah, it's even you know there's even public money in it. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. So really, very. That's some really, really exciting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about sort of the the business and what you've got into it. So you know we talked a lot about your sort of the change of the business over time. What do you do to keep yourself kind of up to date and sharp so that you can continue to pivot and, and find new markets and think about different ways. Cause the, you know, the economy's changing, right? We got to change with it. It's, you know, adapt or die. Sure. It's, you know, it's, it's a multiple directions. It's everything from going to a trade show, you know, the big Chicago international machine tool show just to gather data. It's, you know, you've got things all over the internet. And it's also, uh, it's good to get into peer to peer coaching, like a Vistage group, just to talk to other people about what they're doing, what their best practices are. 
So I, it's kind of like a 360 degree, just, just keep moving, keep sampling, keep talking, keep listening. Important place to, for you to invest your time in sort of trade groups and, and peer learning? Sure, absolutely. Has it, I mean, do you have any specific areas where you're like, wow, this is really translated to that? Like, is there sort of specifics like, hey, I figured out to do this through that? Or is it just sort of more like you think about it in general terms? No, I think there are specifics. Um, you know, it can be something even like training. There's quite a bit of training money out there that the government has, you know, the state of Connecticut's done an excellent job on putting forth training money. And, you know, by getting together with other people and talking just like, what are you doing? How are you doing it? You learn about something really specific that's really tangible that you can apply to your business. So I definitely, uh, it's always fruitful to talk to others about what they're doing, other business owners, even if they're not in the same industry. It's great to just, you know, what's best practices? What are you doing? What are you thinking about? I actually think you touched on something there, which I've personally found super useful and everyone who I know that's done it has found it very useful, but very, but not enough people do it, which is sort of inter, I think it's inter industry learning. You know, you mentioned Vistage, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, I was involved in EO and, and YPO. I think one of the amazing powers there is people in other industries, right? Many of us get involved in industry trade groups, talk to other people in the business, but we don't spend as much time talking to people outside the business. And I don't know about you, but I've found so much learning and you get to get outside the echo chamber and get more creative thoughts by hearing not someone who's also say in aerospace or also in IT, but someone who's in totally other business that you wouldn't have even thought about. Yeah, I think that's incredibly valuable. In my group, there's, you know, there is a member that's in the steel industry, but we also have people that are in the water industry. <laughs> Uh, and, and other, you know, and, and IT, et cetera. So to get that completely different backgrounds got value. Yeah, no doubt. And what, uh, have you found that there's more alike than different, even in something as opposite of metal forming as water? Absolutely. Because a lot of us have the same problems, but we're coming at it from a different direction, but we have the same problems or the same challenges. So it's great to have somebody who doesn't think the way I think at all. It yeah. has the same problem. Yeah, and you can kind of get that creative juices flowing, right? Oh, maybe yeah. I could learn something. Absolutely. Um, I know you guys spent some time sort of engaging with Plat Tech, um, and I know you kind of came out of doing some some trade school stuff. Tell me about that. Like, how have you thought about engaging, and, and how have you leveraged that to benefit Stratton? Uh, Plat Tech has been really important to us. They're, it's kind of like they're our farm team. They, you know, we've got 16 employees that came out of Plat Tech over a period of 25 years or more. Dave Tuttle runs a great program. Uh, we rely on that very much. We we want to interact. We want to talk to those graduates that are coming out of there. What Dave does is uh, is so important concerning what we're ready to latch on to concerning that candidate that comes out of his program. So we're really ready to like you know load them up into the next level of technology, the next challenges such as what we're looking at today. And uh, I can't say enough about the program. It's just, it's really key to our, you know, it's hard to believe that 20 years ago, they kind of abandoned these programs, you know, <laughs> Connecticut and, and the rest of the country kind of drank the Kool-Aid on the fact that we, we're not going to be manufacturers. We're going to be a service nation. And we found out that doesn't work. We are manufacturers. We, we build the, great, the greatest stuff in the world. So we have to keep that culture going. And, and programs like Platt are, are part of that. Do you find that, you know, you had mentioned earlier in our conversation the idea that you, know, you found some challenges by things kind of offshoring to Japan. You didn't use those words, but you did sort of mention overseas competition. And we've heard from others that that trend seems to be reversing in a lot of areas. Are you sensing some of that? I am. Uh, I'm seeing components now that we would have written off and said, only, only done overseas. And now I'm seeing them, what they're calling reshoring, they're coming back. I was walking around my facility with a machinery dealer about a month ago. We have a really large machine and it was made in Taiwan. And he said, you know, that machine today would cost $100,000 to ship overseas to get to you. Now, that's just to California. Then we have to spend another 30,000 to get it from California to Stratford. And so I said to him, I said, well, it makes a lot of sense for you to open up a, a manufacturing site, like maybe in Indiana right. or Connecticut. <laughs> right. And uh, I think that's, that's doable. I mean, the, you know, the United States has always paid attention to being competitive. And through technology and practices, management practices, whatever it may be, we can compete. And so those, so you think what the difference, the increase in shipping costs our ability to say innovate, lean, you know, some of those processes is really helping to drive the reshoring? I think that's part of it. I think the other thing, like right now, we are investing in technology that we can say is lights out. 
So we can literally run machines overnight or part of the night unattended. The building's dark. The machines are running. That's a beginning for us. We're not really deep into it yet, but some companies are deeper into it. And that's going to make them competitive in terms of some of these global parts that were only going to be done in China, for, for instance. Uh, now they're going to be done here. How does Lights Out Manufacturing help you do that? Well, think about it. You don't have labor on it at that time, at that moment. Um, even your cost for electricity may be lower. You might be at a lower rate. Um, the machines that are designed to do that can generally have a robotic type system, which means they're changing out a part and grabbing another. So those are all things that make you competitive. How are you thinking? I mean, that seems like you got to have some technology behind it, right? I mean, you don't oh, yeah. just you don't just yeah. plug in a lights out machine and it just goes by itself. So how do you guys think about you know building up the technology that you need to have to operate a machine like that? Sure. So it's a big investment. There's no doubt about that. And then it's training and it's having people that are are minded towards working in that respect. So it certainly is an investment, but I think uh, the end result is that it's rewarding and that, you know, it's great to be able to compete. It's just, it feels great to be able to compete. Do you you think having that level of technology impacts your ability to attract different types of workers? Certainly, it it does. Uh, Employees today are looking at, sure, money is a certain threshold, but beyond that, it's quality of life. And are you going to challenge me? Am I going to learn by being here? Those are all things that are on the current employee's mind that, that you want to attract. So talk, I'm going to circle back to the thing you said before about the farm system. And, you know, one of the things that I often hear from people in all walks of business, manufacturing is no different, is we want to hire someone with experience, hit the ground running day one, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we, we all know that, right? And of course, we'd all love that. But but you've got mm-hmm. a farm system. How do you think about leveraging that farm system? Because you're going to, you know, you're going to get people that are a little bit greener, right, coming out of the farm system. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Everybody would like to have somebody experience walk through the door. Well, good luck. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't happen. Sure. Uh, it happens once in a while. But in the meantime, you know, you really have to turn on. You have to have a training program. We brought in an HR professional. That was a key move for us about five years ago. We really needed that. And that's a component of recruiting. And you really have to have a recruiting system that's bringing people and attracting them. And then once you get them, you have to have then a training system that is going to move them through those paces. You know, think back to World War II. Overnight, we had to build ships, planes, uniforms. Tanks, everything. Everything everything had to be made. And there was a system to do that. We pulled it off. And there's no reason why we can't take a, a young person who's eager and uh, enthused and say, okay, we have a system for moving you through the learning curve. Can so what made you say, you said it was like five years ago you hired this professor? Approximately. So what made you at that point decide, okay, now's the right time to do it? Because, you know, bringing on that expense, I'm sure it's not a small expense. Uh, how'd, you, how'd you think about it? How'd you think about bringing them on? Like, just talk that through. Well, prior to bringing Donna, our HR professional, I was the HR department. <laughs> so, and I wasn't professional at it. <laughs> I wasn't that good at it, but it was my problem. So I I started really thinking about it. And uh, when I first met Don, I said, look, I think this is part-time. Let's give it a try. And really quickly, both of us concluded this was not part-time. This is a full-time thing. And uh, it really changed the course of our company because we started to get much more organized about how we managed our business. You know, we really wanted to put people on an elevated level of attention. And, you know, if you're running a company, it's hard to do that. Well, Mm -hmm. Uh, you might think you're doing it, but you're not doing it well. An HR professional does that well. And that was important to make that move. So uh, we never look back. That's it's you know, it's a position that we're never going to not have. It's really important. If I was starting a new company, I think that would probably be maybe my first hire is get that HR professional. Because everything comes from that, right? Everything we everyone talks about. It's all about the people. It's all about the people. Yeah. But how many how many put their how many people put the money where their mouth is right. by hiring those people? So when you brought them on, like, when, what was the scope of the responsibility where you started, and has that changed? Like, what was sort of the mission of of this role? Uh, well, you know, there's a couple of really primary things. One is to attract people, keep people, uh, follow compliance to make sure that you're legal as well. Uh, the exciting thing, though, for me was getting people and keeping them. And, and, and the other thing that you don't realize when you're running a company is that you kind of think everybody thinks like you do, but they don't. And your HR professional will go out there and find out what they're really thinking about. What are their dreams? You might have a young person that's out there that wants to be the sous chef at the Four Seasons. Do you know that? You should know that. 
And if you do know that, that's okay. You might say, okay, in two years, we're going to help you get there. Do you want to spend two more years with me? And this is what we'll do together. And that way you sort of have a game plan because that person may be really valuable right now, but they're not going to be with you forever. They have other dreams. You should know what those dreams are. So is that, is that an attitude that you learned post bringing Don on? I mean, that's yeah, a really, yeah, it is. Yeah. I didn't have all that in my head. No, that was, uh, this no, was, I just knew I need relief. <laughs> I was like, please come help me uh, reduce my pain. Yeah. 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 Listen, right. I, look, uh, I, w- I definitely want to pull on this so much more because this is such an important area that people are struggling with. And I think don't really know their way. Don't know their, they feel the pain. They know it's there, but don't hundred percent see their way out of it. So you, you talked about, well, I guess, Really quickly, on the background, when you look to hire somebody, you say you hired an HR professional. What does that mean? Someone who'd been doing HR for years beforehand? Sure. Yeah. Donna was, uh, she had 25 plus years with a large company, big Fortune 500 company. So really got a great rounding of knowledge and, you know, real experience, real life experience. And uh, it's great to have that, you know. Uh, Some of these services are also available through payroll, you know, companies, et cetera. But I think uh, having somebody on staff, it, you know, there's just there's so much there's so much there to do to care for your people. Whether what are they thinking about? How are their benefits? How do they feel about their benefits? They like them or they not like them? Um, they're not necessarily going to tell you the owner either. They don't really want to come up to you and say, you know, my benefits <laughs> stink. <laughs> right, David, I'm not happy. Yeah, right, right. They're, but they'll tell her. But Donna's able to kind of yeah, pull they'll that tell out. Her. And particularly if she puts a form in front of them and says, just give me your thoughts. On this. What's, what's sort of been her strategy, you know, along with you, I'm sure you guys work together, but what's been her sort of strategy surrounding this idea of, like you say, attract and retain? You said that a few times, right? Get people in, help them be here. You talked about training. Maybe talk a little bit about your thoughts around how do you attract and then what do you do to retain? Well, uh, to attract... Yeah, we we really have to think a lot about our business physically. How does it look when someone comes in? Uh, what is the equipment like? Who else is working there? What's the culture like? Uh, that's you know that's an important component of it. Uh, we've also brought in uh, you know a recruiter to help us as well, just part time, just for you know we really had to have that extra energy in terms of reaching out to people and saying, hey, we'd like you to think about working at our company. So. Uh, those have all been important things. But I think right now, uh, the good thing about our labor shortage is it's forcing companies like mine to be better. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to be better at this because if you're not, you're going to lose people. Yeah, no doubt about it. Are you guys doing things differently the last couple of years to recruit than you were doing years ago? I mean, more sort of soft reach outs to passive candidates? Like, how are you guys thinking about finding? We, we're doing all kinds of things. We've, we've even done, you know, industry sort of career fairs. Some of them are really good. Some of them are not. It's, it's hit or miss on some of that, but it's been worth doing. Um, we're getting our name out there. We're using social media like everybody else is as well. I have a billboard over my building. I actually, put, I actually rented out the billboard over my building to uh, you know, just say, hey, we're here and think about it. You know, build your skills at my company. So I've done, I've done radio spots. I've done billboards in other places. I've tried a lot of different things. And, you know, sooner or later, if you keep pushing, something works. So you've, I mean, one of the things I think people will hopefully take away from this, David, is you've been creative. You're not just doing the same old thing, hoping for a different result and complaining about the lack of results. Sounds like you're trying different stuff. Just keep trying. Something will work. Somebody will get your, you know, will pay attention and say, okay, I'm going to stop in there. And what's your value prop? It's interesting. You said we put up a billboard and the billboard, you know, didn't tout what Strat Industries makes. It didn't tout your location. It didn't tout your technology. It didn't tout any of that. You said, build your skills with us. Yes. We we just geared it towards, why would you want to work at my company if you're 22 years old and you've got some inkling of, you know, this is something you'd like to do? Well, you know, if you came out of Plat Tech and maybe you work somewhere else and you're really ready to shift gears, think about us. How do you deliver on that promise? You know, build with us. Like, how do you deliver internally? So that goes back to your training program. And do you have milestones? You know, Ari, in year one, you're going to learn how to do two, three axis machining. After that, we want to get you in year two, you're going to go right up to five axis machining. Those are things that we want to measure. We also want to have you on board that you agree that that's what you'd like to do. So we're both moving in the same way. But we really have to have that that uh, disciplined, you know, milestone on, on the table that this is where we're going and that we got there. Or if we didn't get there, why didn't we get there? Do you have a rigorous interview process that sort of helps you to make sure that the person you're bringing on is aligned to the type of culture and the type of like program that you guys have internally? We're, we're getting there. You know, we're using a system called EOS and, um, 
so part of that is core values mm -hmm. and we're looking for that certain, you know, we're looking for somebody who's gung ho, resourceful, has integrity and treats others with respect. So we, we call that grit. grit. That's our, that's our acronym. Got it. And, uh, so we're looking for grit and, uh, if we see it, then, okay. Yeah. That's so, is it rigorous? It's not really rigorous, but I think it's pointed. It's, it's, it's got a specific goal. Yeah. I got to make sure you're bringing on the right people. And so this also must mean you got to keep investing in the new technology in the business. Talk about how your building looks. If you want to train people on technology. That means you got to be investing in technology. So you're thinking about those things too. Absolutely. We're looking at new technology all the time. We're retiring older machines that, uh, are still capable, but are they really competitive? And would you want to run them? Would you really want to be a part of this uh, piece of technology? So some machines are going out maybe even earlier than we expected, but the one coming in is going to be newer. Every time we bring in a new piece of technology, people get excited. <laughs> so, and not only that, but it makes us competitive. So why not? So we're always looking at, although it's expensive, keep upgrading. So as you keep upgrading, you know, how do you make that ROI decision, right? You're just saying like the machine's busy, but you're still upgrading ahead of time. How are you thinking that through? Well, we're lucky that we're in a pretty busy market right now. We've, you know, we've been busy for the last few years. We've got a pretty good backlog. So we don't have to really stretch too far to say, is the ROI going to be here? Generally, uh, you know, we're not going to buy 20 machines all at once, but if we keep moving through the technology paces, if we bring in a machine, then we look at the next one. What's the next technology upgrade? And it's not just machines, it's software. Uh, it's and it's again, it's even management techniques. Who's coming in to coach us, et cetera. So, uh, you know, you kind of look at that whole dynamic of these facets on, you know, on, on what we're doing and, and it all comes together pretty well. As part of your kind of recruiting process, do you guys think about finding people that maybe look differently or have different backgrounds than the people you've hired in the past, sort of expanding the pool at all? Absolutely. Absolutely. We look very different than we did 20 years ago. Do you? Yeah. We well, very, what, we what, did, what did the company look like 20 years ago versus well, it was all it was all white guys. <laughs> That's basically it. Straight up, yep. Yeah. We have more women and more positions of management than we've ever had. Uh, we have people of color. We're, we're, we're every color of the rainbow right now, so it's uh, it's pretty cool. But have you, have you guys been doing something in particular to drive that diversity? Was that a conscious choice? Was it just sort of happened? I think it kind of happens. Um, we do pay attention to, you know, how our numbers look, but... Yeah, you know, I think we just we've been lucky that we've come across some excellent people and you know what your background is let's go for it. What do you think has driven this idea you mentioned you have more p women in management than ever before. What do you think sort of driven that? I think slowly this industry is waking up. Unfortunately, we have ignored an entire gender for like <laughs> decades. That, that represents like 51% yeah. of the total population. And sure, here yeah. we are all complaining about we don't have enough employees. Right. Why don't we have more women out there running big, giant machine tools? There's no reason why not. No reason. There's no reason why not. So we're slowly getting it, you know. And again, if we tap into let's get the students at a younger age coming out of a plat tech to say, you can do this. This isn't a big, brawny, sweaty environment. This is cool. It's technological. It's, it takes a lot of brain power. We need smart, energized people. Why not? Get it. Yeah. So you think the, the, the idea of, of uh, women not being in manufacturing was a mental hurdle that we've now gotten over? I don't think we've gotten over it yet. No. So we, we have a long way to go, but we're starting to break through the ice. You know, our QC people are, there's a lot of females. HR, accounting, finance, females. Uh, we need to get the shop floor up to the right balance as well. What are you guys doing to, are you doing it? Well, let me say not what are you doing? Are you doing anything to encourage that and, and sort of open the door to that? We're working on it. Um, you know, we're just, again, keeping in touch with all of the channels that we have. Um, we still have more work to do, but we certainly want to get that going because, hey, we need people and we need smart, quick people. So we're going to we're going to keep going there. Has there been changes in sort of your culture either, or, or building or anything that you've done to sort of encourage some of the diversity to help it, to help foster it a little bit more? I can't think of anything really tangible that, that we've done other than just being lucky. Um, we do have a employee referral program, mm. so that may help as well. Uh, we give $1,500 if you bring in somebody that stays for more than like 90 days. Okay. And we've cut a couple, well, we're about to cut a couple checks. We just nice. rolled this out. And we're excited about it. And uh, so I think that's probably, if someone's going to bring their friend in, I think we're going to also, you know, see some diversity from that as well. That's awesome. Um, is your dad still in the business? My dad passed about three years ago. 
Uh, he really wound down, though, many years ago. Um, I've really been running the company for about 25 years. Yeah. So did he bit, did he hang around for a while? You know, he would like to check in. He had his <laughs> golden retriever named Salty, and they would come in. And when you saw the dog run through the building, you knew my dad was there. Well, and then he, my dad would get on the PA, and he'd whistle and say, come on, Salty, let's go. And then Salty would run back up through the building, and then off they would go. So he would just kind of stop in, say hello to a few people. That was good. I mean, you know, I think the secret to our kind of father-son success was that he gave me a lot of latitude. He wasn't hovering around me, like watching over me. <laughs> kind of allowed me to make some mistakes, too. Oh. But I think that really worked for us. Did it help uh, sort of solidify your like longer term relationship, sort of having this thing you guys both built together? And, you know, he sort of had the ability to hand it off to you. I, I just, I don't know, I, I kind of imagined it as a dad myself. Probably was a pretty cool thing. It was a cool thing. And he was like a big library book for me. I could bounce ideas off of him. Uh, you know, they say it's lonely at the top. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's only so many people you can bounce certain problems off of. Mm -hmm. And it's great to have a guy who's been there, who's been in the trenches, to say, I have problem X. And he'd say, well, you might want to think about why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was great to have that resource. And it was fun, too. And it not was, just it someone was, there, but someone that had been literally in your shoes. Yeah. You know? And it was fun to talk about victories like, hey, we just got this great order. You know, and sometimes you got to talk about defeats too. Uh, this one didn't work out, you know, and you know, you know that you're talking to a guy that understands that. How do you think he felt about the direction and the growth that you took the company after, uh, after he stepped out? He was, uh, he was really proud of it. He was, he was very excited about it, you know, and my dad was not one to give compliments easily. So if he said something good, it was like, wow, where'd that come from? Yeah. When you got one of those dads, he, he the got, littlest things right. get magnified. But he never criticized either. I have to say he was not a critical guy. So that was good. That was a balance. Yeah. 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 What's the, uh, what's the future from a generational perspective? Is there? Um, well, you know, um, I'm not seeing any signs that my kids are going to actually to go into this okay. right now, but we'll see. Um, my daughter's 16, my son's 13. So, so we got some time yet. We got some time and uh, we'll see. But, you know, it's still, hey, you know, I, I feel energized. You know, my feet hit the floor every day. It's kind of a yabba dabba do moment. And, yep, yep. Uh, I just want to get up and go. So I'm really excited about it still. Change, you know, we're doing a couple of additions. We bought our neighbor's building. We're building an addition on another building. So we're in a constant moment of change, which is really exciting for me. I like that. And, and one of our employees, you know, stopped me the other day and says, you know, I really like the fact that we're always changing, which is great. So listen, man, you got to keep growing. You got to keep moving, right? Cause you're either growing or dying. There's nothing, that's right. So there's nothing yeah, in between. That's it. So well, we're doing it. Well, David, it was great having you on. I'm going sw to switch to a rapid fire round let's of questions to wrap it up. You ready? Okay, let's do it. All right, man. Red Sox or Yankees? Yankees. Yeah. Shelton guy figured, uh, Starbucks or Duncan? Duncan. Staycation or exotic destination? Staycation. Ooh, sports car or SUV? SUV. iPhone or Android? iPhone. You got a favorite business book? Uh, really good book, Outthink the Competition by Kaihan Krippendorf. Wow, Outthink the Competition. I Outthink do not know that one. Great book. It's going to make my list. Um, if you had to do something other than being president of Stratton Enterprises and... It could be anything in the whole wide world. What would you do? Well, I think, you know, running a company, whether it's big or small, you learn a lot of skills. And I think it would be really interesting to, you know, and I open the newspaper, it's kind of like the world's a mess. Mm -hmm. So it would be kind of interesting just to go to some other part of the world, whether that's United Nations or whatever it may be, and see what I could do to help out elsewhere. Other than that, I'd like to write comedy for Saturday Night Live. with. <laughs> <Tim>. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, David, what's something that you learned early in your life or early in your career that you think helped propel you to all the success that you've had? Uh, I think that um, just keep plugging away. You know, don't give up. Uh, and don't forget that you're part of the equation. A lot of times you think, oh, you know, I don't have enough help. But remember, don't, don't forget to count yourself into that equation. That's what I learned. What's something that you learned later in your life or later in your career that if you went back and told young David and he listened to you, it would really make a positive impact? Make a good plan. Remember that time passes faster than you think. Surround yourself with good people and get coaching. Wow. There you go. David, thank you so much for coming on. It's been Ari, super interesting. It's a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by Compass MSP. Thanks for listening and spending some time with me today. My goal is to help build a strong manufacturing community, and it would be impossible to do without all of you.